I'm Peter Bergen. I run the uh, an international security program here at New America. It's my privilege to introduce a, a, a wonderful panel uh, today uh, about the question of uh, women and uh, their presence or lack thereof uh, in the media, in particular on the issues of national security. Uh, the panel will be mo moderated by uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who of course is the CEO and President of New America, former Head of Policy Planning at the State Department, former Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, the author or editor of about to be seven books, uh, because our most recent book will be <laughs> on an issue that's related, to, which is the work family balance. Uh, uh, and uh, to her immediate left, to your right, is Elmira bay Rasley who is uh, co-founder of Foreign Policy Interrupted, and this is really an event to highlight their work about uh, trying to make w women more prominent in the, in, in the public space on the issue of foreign affairs and national security. Uh, Elmira has uh, worked with a number of uh, leading media outlets, including Foreign Affairs, Fareed, affairs, uh, Fareed Zakaria's program on CNN, CNN GPS. Uh, and then immediately to her right uh, is Lauren Bone, who's an independent journalist based in Istanbul. Thank you for coming all the way here for this. Uh, she is a columnist for Foreign Policy magazine, um, amongst many other things. She also was one of the assistant, ed uh, one of the founding editors of that excellent journal, the Cairo Review, which is sort of the Egyptian version of foreign affairs, uh, and is a Pulitzer Center grantee uh, and an overseas press club fellow in, with the Associated Press in 2012. Next to her is Ben Pauker, who is uh, a great friend of New America, um, uh, the executive editor of foreignpolicy.com. Uh, I learned something about Ben, who I've known for many years uh, today, which is he's the co-founder of the Grast Gastronauts, which is the world's largest adventurous oh. eating club. Oh, who's that? <laughs> 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 which we'll have to get into in the Q&A. <laughs> And finally, we have Tyra Finney, who's a political strategist and a well-known media contributor, a communications consultant. She hosted the show Disrupt with Karen Finney on MSNBC. She worked at four years as spokesman and uh, director of communications at the DNC. She's written for The Hills, commentator for Politico, and at MSNBC, and The Huffington Post. So turn it over to Anne Marie. Great. Thank you. So thank you. The first thing is just I can't tell you how great it is to look out and see this audience. I would like to recruit all of you to be where we are on countless uh, uh, television shows and in every other setting where you can talk about foreign policy. And actually, I don't think I've ever been at a foreign policy event other than one that was explicitly on empowering women where we had anything like this ratio. So that's a great start. Uh, very quick, we're sorry it took us so long to get started. We've been swapping Amtrak stories uh, in the <laughs> back room. And we won't go, won't go there. So we're going to talk about um, the relative lack of women uh, on foreign policy. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the fact which we'll hear about in terms of the underrepresentation uh, of women on important foreign policy subjects. This is not going to be news to any of you. Many of us have experienced it uh, in multiple ways uh, personally. But we're going to talk about the, the fact of it, and then we're going to talk about why that matters. I mean, is this just because we believe in diversity and it's great and there should be one of everything uh, in any public forum? Or does this really make a difference in terms of, the, of what we are hearing and thinking about foreign policy issues, about global issues, about how we solve public problems in the global sphere. And then we're going to talk about, so what do we do about it? Aside from foreign policy interrupted, which is a huge, I mean, not aside from, that's a huge <laughs> step. We're going to talk about how that makes a difference and what else we can do. So with that, let me begin by saying, I mean, when I said we've experienced it personally, I frequently speak on television uh, and on radio. But particularly in television, I was saying in, in the back, if I'm there, there's obviously some female representation. But there are all sorts of ways in which I'm pretty sure if you did a, uh, a survey or a very careful monitoring of actual airtime, you would see that women are speaking considerably less than men, even when women and men are equally represented, uh, or, or, or they're speaking less than they should be proportionally. So there are all sorts of ways in which female voices are either not there or less heard heard even when they are there. But I'm going to uh, start with Elmira uh, and ask you to talk about, you and Lauren both, to talk about uh, your sense of uh, the lack. And then we'll talk about, uh, put that in context. Sure. Well, thank you so much, um, Anne-Marie, for not only organizing this, but for, for being one of our founding board members and really, really getting behind and a us. a regular tweeter. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> a, a champion 
<laughs> a champion of ours. Um, I'll, I'll start out and then I'll hand it over to Lauren. Essentially, um, I, you're right. I think that there's, there is a disparity between the number of women that we see commenting on foreign policy issues um, and they, they'll, they'll call upon you and then they'll say, we, you know, we checked the box and, and that was it. And then they'll be, they'll be, you know, every, I think about every six months there's kind of an uproar about where are the women. Um, recently, Mark Lynch and Tara Witz, they, they published a piece in the Washington Post that actually said, you know, a, among the six leading think tanks in Washington, D.C., um, over the I think it was over the past year, there was not a single woman represented speaking about Middle Eastern issues. Um, and then there's this uproar about wh where are the women? Well, I can tell you, we're right here. <laughs> um, and but here. but but the thing is, we we sit and there's an uproar and there's there's, there's lots of people being getting angry about it. And Lauren and I came together and we said we don't want to be angry anymore. We just want to be at the table mm -hmm. and we want to have a constructive discussion. We have things to say and we would like to contribute our voices to that. So we said, let's dissect the problem. What is the problem? And we looked at it and we said that there's two essential problems. There's one. There's an internal problem where I think we women. I think there is. I think there's an element of where we do hesitate to volunteer and raise our hands until we're perfect. I will speak for only for myself on that, where I feel that I'm, you know, only until I'm, you know, I've actually studied every single talking point and I've read every single article, will I raise my hand? Well, you know what? I needed to get over that. Yeah. I know. I know. I know my issues. <laughs> you know, progress, not perfection. And perfect is the enemy of good. And so you know, that's one element of it. And so how do we actually get over that internal barrier? The second um, element that Lauren and I realized as we hit upon is you know, the media's changed. And while we complain about w where are the women, the jobs of bookers and producers and editors today is really hard. It's a 24-7 mm -hmm. news cycle. And everybody is competing to get out good quality content. And when you're under, and when you're facing that pressure, what you do is you need to rely on, on what you know. And the reality is, what what bookers, producers, and editors know, is is white a dudes. rolodex of of white men. White dudes. And you know that <laughs> needs to change. But we also need to help them change that. We right. can't just blame. We can't assign blame to these organizations. We need to be in a position where we can help change them. Um, and so we decided to create this platform that addresses both of those issues. And I'll hand it over to Lauren to talk about what we're doing. Great. Yeah, you know, real quick, and I, I just want to make this really clear. We're not saying we need women in the conversation for diversity's sake. We truly and honestly believe that when we have more women at the table opining, and not just more women, we'll, we'll get to a slew of racial and ethnic disparities that we plan to address as well. But when you have more voices at the table, you have more, you're creating a more likely environment for solutions, more possible solutions. You're incubating not just voices, but you're incubating possible solutions. Look, foreign policy, gone are the days where it's one dimensional, really hard issues of security and military and men talk war fast. And we're, we love talking war. We can, we can talk war for the next two hours. But what I'm saying is, so many of the issues now in foreign policy mandate a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted approach. We need to talk education. We need to talk healthcare. We need to talk entrepreneurship. These are no longer soft issues. There is no hierarchy of issues. Look at the world around us. 2015, we're here to interrupt, not just by having women at the table, but more voices. We specifically don't have women in our name because beyond you know, bringing more women to the table, we also want to interrupt foreign policy on the basis of new and ideas that go beyond the beltway, that, that you know, challenge these, these paradigms that we've all clung to. Um, this is a movement. We're really freaking excited to be here, and we want you to be excited. <laughs> and we're going to interrupt. It's time we move beyond this conversational cul-de-sac, this echo chamber where the women would have oh, quoted, no, no, no. let's start doing something. And we'll get to in a little bit what we plan to do. But we're so excited to be here, and you should be too. OK, great. So uh, Karen, I'm going to ask you, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, to Ben uh, on, on this moment. But we love you. We need we you love here. Ben. We love you. <laughs> we love Ben's also a wonderful editor. So I, I want, I want uh, Karen. I want you to speak to to the point about it. It isn't all the bookers. It's women not putting themselves forward. It's women not uh, feeling feeling much less secure about opining. I have to say, when I first started uh, being on TV, 
I was dumbfounded. I mean, suddenly people were calling me to speak about just about anything, right? Because I had spoken about it. Well, right. I mean, so I'd spoken about Syria. I could speak about Siberia. What's the difference? I mean, they sure. Uh, and my reaction was immediately, whoa, 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 I'm not an expert on that. I, and it, I'd gotten over the idea that I wasn't an expert on anything. I was willing to say I was expert in this and this and this. But, but suddenly there was a lot of, you know, a, a lot of push. And you've yeah. had the experience. You've been on the other side, right? You've had your own show. You clearly believe you wanted female voices. But yeah. talk to us about what that felt like. So I just want to point, I'm going to touch on, I'm also a senior fellow at Media Matters. Uh, and we have a forthcoming study that actually takes a look at really what are the disparities. Um, and just, just a top line number, it's about 22% is about how many women you will see talking about whether it's foreign. Also, I think we should clarify foreign policy days, these days. It's foreign policy. It's war. It's terrorism. It's diplomacy. I mean, what ca constitutes those conversations, I think, has actually broadened. Um, so I will start by telling you my mother, who is here, uh, wanted to be a foreign service officer and was told, you know, took the test, all of that, and was told in the 60s, the natural order of women is to go have babies. Lucky for me, that's what she did. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of where I think I, I would start there only because when you then cut to, you know, in the early 2000s when I was actually at the DNC on the side of trying to get people booked, there weren't as many women, frankly, and part of that was because I think a lot of women got turned away at, at too young of an age. And so finding women was a real challenge. And then also saying to them, you can talk about this. Like, you wrote a whole book about this. What do you mean you can't talk about this? <laughs> um, and we were talking about this backstage. I mean, I love men. I really do. But they'll talk about anything. They don't care if they don't know. They'll just, they're happy to go on and talk. And as women, <laughs> we do. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, and as women, we, I mean, I, I joked the other night, I've seen plenty of panels with men talking about women, and as a woman of color, <laughs> white men talking about, you know, what people of color want. I mean, you know, so the disparities are everywhere. Um, and on the booking side, so when I was at the DNC, trying to get, and I'm talking about Diane Feinstein, very senior women from, you know, the armed services and, and foreign affairs committees, getting them booked on some of the Sunday show roundtables was very tough. Why? Because they wanted John McCain, or they wanted Lindsey Graham. Like, they had their men, John Kerry, they're all great, but they had their men that they were so used to going to that it was much harder to say, I mean, literally it was a, just give her a chance, just let's just try. Um, and then having my own show several years later, the pressure to try to, I mean, it has to come from the host, it has to come from the producers, it has to be made a priority with the bookers, and I will add to this that one of the challenges is you don't have as many women in those positions, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the bias, they don't even think about the fact that they're not, um, unless it is made a very conscientious, you know, and what we used to do is we would look at the board and look at the segments and say, okay, that's not gonna work, there's not enough diversity, I want women, we don't, you know, we need some people of color to, you know, build this out. Um, but you have to ha have that kind of discipline. And in a 24-hour news cycle, my show was on twice a week, so we had a little more time. When it's a day in and day out grind, yeah. bookers go for, like, who do I know is going to say yes and is going to, I know is going to be good TV, and I know, it, or is, I know is going to give me a quote for my story, right. um, is a lot of what happens. And it is true that when women are on, and one of the things the study at Media Matters doesn't quite show is, you know, there are plenty of times where there might be a woman on and she gets to speak once but technically she's still in the box so she's still on the screen um, and it's how do we also as women when we get that opportunity to be on make sure that we get to say what it is we are there to say and try to get over and I talked about this the other night part of this as women we just got to get over it a little bit and get over sort of not wanting to interrupt or feeling like you know, well, they're, you know, I'll let the, the guys have their chance and, and really having that confidence that, what, you know, you're there as an expert. So be an expert and say what it is you're there to say. So, Ben, I, I, I asked you to speak less, not just to draw that <laughs> funny contrast, but um, so I want to, so women often don't want to, are, are worried they're not expert enough. Uh, they, it's, it's often harder for them to project the kind of, persona that makes for good TV, there are these various reasons. But there are other reasons, too. So I was part of a group, I think you, think you were part of it, a sort of email group of foreign policy, national security women uh, in town. 
uh, that pointed, it, that did a study of how many female columnists foreign policy had, and the number was not good. I think it was one uh, at that point, Rosa Brooks. And we were all up in arms. And then some of us started saying, well, you know, actually, in my case, foreign policy has asked me to be a columnist. And I said no. And more and more people started acknowledging that, in fact, we had been approached, but we'd said no. So in our cases, so there are a couple things going on there. One is, if you are a woman and there are not many women, boy, are you deluged, right? I mean, it's like being a mentor or being anything. If there are not many of you, if certainly the women of color in this, organ in, in this audience will get that. If you're anything that there are not a lot of, you have more invitations you can do anything with. There were also a bunch of us who said, a weekly column that's so much to commit to. I've got kids. I've got too much to do already. I'm just not going to do it. So I wondered if you would talk a little bit about you've made huge efforts and made a huge difference. And foreign policy is very committed to making this difference. But sort of the how, you, how it looks from your vantage point. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not easy to write a weekly column. I mean, I, I, in, in my role as an editor, I find it very hard to actually find the time to write. And a lot of people in very challenging careers feel the same way. Uh, I can speak a little bit to what we at FP have done. Um, you know, and it actually started before there was this conversation. I think we realized our magazine was getting a little bit boring, a little <laughs> bit. There was a, too many of the same voices. When you look at uh, you know, our magazine's readership, it's only 13% on a daily basis is a Washington readership. It's mm -hmm. only it's less than 50% US. And our mission has changed a lot from being sort of the voices of Washington and spicing them up and giving them a, a say about what US policy is to covering the world. I mean, we are, if not 24-7, pretty close to that in publishing 20, 25 articles a day. Um, and it was a lot of the same voices. And it started to feel a little bit stale. So a couple of years ago, we really embarked on a project to make sure that we were finding new writers, uh, trying to tackle an issue of diversity, uh, reaching out to new voices. and. Uh, a big portion of that was a gender issue. Um, so we went from having one regular female columnist to now having 11, which is half of our regular roster of 22. Uh, our editorial staff, and this wasn't even a conscious effort, our editorial staff is roughly 50-50, and you know, could be 48, 52. Uh, half of our senior editors and our senior positions are women. And it just makes us a better publication. Uh, there's no other way to say it. We still, you know, I think of this every day, we still fail in representing the big world we cover adequately. And a lot of that's just really tricky, I'll say as an editor. It's not easy to find, you know, a, a Pakistani woman who can write eloquently and regularly about covering issues. And sometimes it's just the nature of the beast that it's easier to find someone who you've worked with before, who could be, you know, a man in a think tank here at Brookings Institution or a place like that who has the chops, who's done it before, and can give you the thousand words you need when something happens. Not to interrupt you, but your male columnists, <laughs> interestingly, publish more frequently than your, your female columnists. You, know, you track it. It's interesting. You have equity, but the fact of the matter is the men publish more frequently. That, that's a function of, uh, of some of them just being on a track where they are writing. They've been doing it more frequently. Well, it's, a, it's a function of, I think, sort of this confidence gap as well. Or not confidence gap, but women holding themselves to a higher threshold of certainty before they give their opinion. And, and not just that, as we talked about in New York City, it's also, I mean, the confidence gap doesn't necessarily exist in a vacuum. Uh, one writer, Jessica Valenti, says that actually the confidence gap might just be a keen understanding of women, of, of how little the conversation in society values them. Because women also know that if they do have gumption and if they do have confidence and if they publish regularly, there are going to be people who are like, who does she think she is? Well, so, I, so let, me, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask Ben, to, because the other way to look at this would be, I could write much more than I do, but it's not going to be very good. Exactly. Right. And it's so, so in suckers. other words, it's not. I just know it's going to be thin. I, it'll it'll be okay, but it'll be thin. And so, I mean, which way do we want to go here? Do we want to say that the male columnist should publish less, so the female columnist should publish more? Some or? of our male columnists probably should publish a little <laughs> bit less. Uh, I'm not going to name any names. No. Um, oh, I go. think we have a really good roster. Uh, but we didn't select, you know, we selected that roster by trying to find the best, best available people, but also with an eye towards the gender balance. You know, it was like, we need the, I want to find the best writer on global climate change issues. 
And if that, you know, so you know, I tasked the editors with coming up with a list. And then we waited to a certain extent, you know, women whose voices were underrepresented. And we wanted, that was a goal. Um, you know, but we, we don't spur people to write. You know, I think foreign policy used to be, you know, someone files on the Thursday, someone files on the Friday. Now when you have 22 people and so much news and an in-house reporting team that's grown from being one person to 12 people, you know, there's a, there's a lot of content that we have to juggle and only so many editors. And I don't need, as an editor, I don't need four people weighing in on the same subject. You know, the national security strategy is going to be released on Friday. You don't, but can I? Can yeah. I, I'm going to interrupt <laughs> you yeah, now. Well, I'm going well, to I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you, but here, <laughs> you here's where, here is, here, here. here is also <laughs> where I think women, because, because they traditionally have been less underrepresented in the media, they haven't had the experience with working with editors. And editors, when you're working with the same people, you know their style, you know what they do, and then you can work with them. But here's where I found, I, I pitched the New York Times last year, I pitched them on a piece, and it wasn't exactly right. The male editor sat with me and he said, let's work on this because there's really good stuff in here. And he actually took the time because he said, I really believe in your mission. And I actually produced a piece and I got onto the pages piece, and I got onto the pages of the New York Times. But it was because he was actually very conscious and he recognized that there was something there. He didn't reject me outright, but he actually took a proactive stance on that. And I think that that's also something that the media I think that that that's incumbent upon the editors and the bookers as well. It's incumbent. Okay, hang on. Yeah, hang on. Yeah, okay. uh, Karen wants to jump in. I just wanted to add to this um, sort of an economic perspective because part of the reality and we saw this frankly in uh, the last elections in 2008, right, and, and 2012, the increase in African Americans watching the pre what was happening in politics because of the pr election of Barack Obama and, and his candidacy. Bless, Bless you. <laughs> so you know you had the networks, probably not so much Fox, uh, <laughs> but MSNBC and CNN certainly, you know, both uh, competing for uh, for those viewers, particularly at a time when viewership and cable is going down across the board. Frankly, television across the board, and they're flipping out about it, trying to find these new viewers. And women are a very important economic force in this country and a part of that. And so part of what I, I also, this is part of the like, we got to get over it is, we do have economic power and we don't always take advantage of it. It matters when people are looking at ratings, right? And they're looking at, you know, what's the key demographic of young people and women and people of color and where's our opportunity for growth? Women are an important constituency and part of what we as viewers and consumers of media have to make clear is we want to see more viewer, more faces and voices that look like us or sound like us. And again, not just because I want to check a box and hear a woman, but because I want to hear a broader perspective. I want to hear more voices so that I can be more informed. So let me ask you a question and then I'm going to move us to, to the difference that it makes. Because, uh, but. So do you think, and I'm asking all of you too, that if there were a foreign policy show that were only women, that women would watch it? I have pitched for many years. I would like to see, I don't know just on foreign policy, but, I but look at how well the talk and the view and all these shows are doing, right? Everybody's trying to get their all woman show now. Um, we did a thing right before the election at MSNBC. It was all women and we talked everything from foreign policy to domestic policy, the whole thing. And it did better than a lot of the other shows. I mean, it did phenomenally well. That's interesting. So I actually think if you had a, an all woman show that was talking about a broad range of issues, I do think women would watch that so actually. That's, it's, the reason I asked is, I mean, The View, absolutely, because that's a talk show and women are good at talking, we know that. But there, there is this ingrained, you know, to what extent have women internalized that foreign policy is a serious subject and you need a certain amount of serious authoritative male voices and then you can mix it up, but if it's all women, is it as... Uh, consequential, I don't know. I, that, that, so it's interesting that you have, have some yeah. data, but, the, but I think there is this, this is where I want to go now. What difference does it make to have diverse voices? Because, and I'll, I'll start off, that foreign policy as I learned it was an entirely male preserve, and it's still, we've now had three women secretaries of state, but that follows on some 70 male secretaries of state, or however many. <laughs> And it was, you know, this is the oak paneled rooms. This is the guy talking to the other guy about matters of state. Uh, so it was, the whole, 
vision of what foreign policy is, much more than domestic policy, health policy, education, those are areas that touch on parts of women's lives in a way that I think foreign policy long didn't. So then my question is, but so what difference does it make that you have a woman, or do we think we're going to actually hear something different? And here we're treading very close to the dangerous waters of essentialism, as you and I have discussed. Yes, we've discussed right? We don't really want to say, well, she's going to say something different because she's a woman. But so what are we interrupting? Or when we interrupt, what are we hearing? Well, I think that in terms of, I think it is, I, I, you know, I'm all for women's programs. I think that, I, I think everything helps. I think everything contributes to it. But at least from our perspective, we don't, we don't want to segregate out women. What we want to do is we want to bring women's voices and women to the table. And I think as, as Lauren touched on as, as in the opening, it's about actually finding solutions. The 21st century is a different beast. I mean, you know, yes, foreign policy used to be done in oak paneled rooms with gray suited diplomats, but it's not like that anymore. It's very dynamic, it's changing, and so things like education, healthcare, entrepreneurship, economics are no longer just soft issues. And I know that you've talked about this extensively before. Um, foreign policy is not just war. It's not just about defense and military. It has to, all of those other things have to combine and come to it. And I think when we're talking about expertise and we're talking about quality, you know, Men can't be an expert in everything, and that's why it's so important to bring the diverse voices, whether they're women, whether they're a development worker in Somalia, or whether they're on the ground in China. We're not just talking also about Americans. I think that we also need to bring actual no, no, people. Well, that's way too shocking. You know, I mean, it's so <laughs> you know, we need to actually bring people who are on the ground, who speak the, the local languages in these places, and hear from their perspectives. And that's what we're advocating for, because the world, it's, it's dynamic and it's changing, and we need dynamic solutions that can match that. And when you're bringing diversity into it, then you're actually widening the pool. It's about adding value. It's not about pointing fingers, and it's not about trying to shame and blame anyone. And then also, I mean, so Ben, you bring up a good point. So, and let's just talk, <laughs> you, you actually bring up a good point, just one, just one. Um, but okay. I, I want to seg this into solutions because we're talking a lot about the disparity, which we all know, and again, this, this conversational cul-de-sac, we just have to steer, we have to steer around it and talk about solutions. So you had mentioned, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get, you know, a Pakistani woman, you know, to write quickly or eloquently, or I don't know the adjective you used, and I don't want to misquote you. Um, you're right. And it is incumbent upon you to find it, but we are acutely aware, I'm a journalist, of you know, the bandwidth, the little bandwidth that you're dealing with. So Foreign Policy Interrupted, how many of you guys subscribe to our newsletter? Cool. Do Everybody you like our GIFs? Should. Did you like the Beyonce <laughs> GIF last week? How many of you subscribe to Foreign Policy? Okay, all right, all right, all right. We'll get you, we'll get you. I do. Drop the mic, drop the mic. Just, we we got some, this. Yeah. We should have some sign-ups on the way No, out, totally. Actually. All right, we got you. Um, so we're a visibility platform right now, and we're highlighting the women who are opining on you know, China security issues, on what's happening in Somalia, on what's happening, happening in Argentina, for the very purpose of you know, interrupting your inbox and, and serving you brain food, but also so producers and editors can't say, I just couldn't find a woman to write on this. Charlie Pennell, Ch or Charlie Rose only had you know five dudes on his panel because we just couldn't find a woman who who's who's an expert on on China besides Anne Marie Slaughter. Um, no, so <laughs> I guess I'm so, supposed to say, of course I am. Yeah, of course. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> besides, in addition to, in addition to. Um, so what we're doing though, beyond the visibility platform and and trying to make your life easier as a talent agency, we're we have a fellowship program that's going to open next week. Applications for it. Um, and what we're doing is we're picking, it's a pilot program for now, four-ish fellows who have expertise in one particular area. And we're giving her one-on-one -on -one media training. So, and because that's the pain point. It's, okay, finding that woman who's on the ground, but maybe she doesn't have a lot of, you know, uh, skills writing and you don't have time to, you know, guide her. So we have that part covered. And we're pairing her with an editorial mentor at a major mainstream news outlet. So he or she will work with her regularly to produce op-eds around her expertise and to really cultivate and develop her voice. 
So what we envision foreign policy interrupted it as is a two-pronged solution to a very complicated problem. You have the external barriers, you have the institutional barriers, and then you also have this internal sort of lean-in-esque anthem that we, we need to work on. But we also need to work on creating the environment that values these voices so that women, when women do lean in, they're leaning into an environment that values what they have to say, which is why we need to have buy-in from editorial boards, from you know the the business side of things, which you know all happen to be men. We need to have buy-in from men that not only is this disparity a problem, but that we need to get innovative. We have to create solutions around it. So I think just going back to your initial question on what women bring to the table, I think there's a couple of things to mention. Number one um, is I think we have more women in more position where they've either worked on anti-terrorism efforts, as Zero Dark Thirty taught us, some women were the ones who found mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden, let's not forget that, right? I think we have more women in these places. Uh, but I think part of the problem, it's the same problem that we face in the general economy, which is women get to a certain age and you want to have a family and there's not the support to then that work family balance and then to be at those higher levels, which is where you then, that's where a lot of bookers or editors are sort of looking for those people. I think one of the great things about the way media has changed is you can work from home, you can write from home. Um, but you know, the other side of it is I think we've expanded you know, in this definition of you know, foreign policy. I think we understand now nations are more stable when women are part of the economy. Right? When, that in order to, when people are educated, when people have you know, access to improving their lives and economic opportunity. And I, I would say that it was a lot of the women, former secretaries of state, who brought that really to the fore in the, in the Absolutely. conversation. And I will give a specific example of my former boss, Hillary Clinton. When she was first lady, you know, we did a lot of you know, soft diplomacy and went all over the world and you know, flowers and all that kind of stuff. We visited a lot of very cool programs, women, particularly economic empowerment of women and girls, because that's her thing. And one of the things that she noticed everywhere we went was that you, the USAID people and programs were sort of over here that's as cool. the like soft, you know, oh, that's so cute what they do. And then like the, you know, embassy staff and the diplomacy and the foreign, you know, the security people, they were sort of over here and we would do sort of an event with them and an event with them. And, you know, she always thought, wait, this doesn't make sense. And when she was Secretary of State and when she was campaigning, one of the things she even talked about was our diplomacy has to be a three-legged stool, right? Our, now, our foreign policy, right? It's got to be diplomacy. It's got to be development. And then it's also got to be defense. And that is now the norm in how we're talking about these issues. So in terms of why it's important to have women there, it's because, you know, we might see something that the guys aren't picking up on. Or as a person of color, I might see something that you just, from your experience, wouldn't pick up on and make it part of the conversation. Absolutely. So Ben, I, I, I want to ask you about how you, you know, you said, well, foreign policy was getting kind of tired and stale and you mixed it up. And I want to talk about sort of what you see. But let me, let me just first respond on um, <coughs> exactly, Karen, what you said. I mean, to me, the first thing I would say is that Hillary Clinton was the first female Secretary of State who could have done that, right? Who could have focused on women, who could have focused on development. Uh, Madeleine Albright certainly cared a lot, but if you're the first woman Secretary of State, sure. you're doing guns and bombs. And, well, and just you know, being there, though. I mean, right. I remember well, all right, the conversations but, about they're not going to shake her hand. What are you going to, how are we going to deal with that? Absolutely. Right? But if she had come out, if Madeleine Albright in 1970, in 1996 had said, okay, we're going to focus on development and we, female empowerment, Absolutely. no chance, right? right? She was the one who said to Colin Powell, so what's that great army for? Right? She was, and yep. then, it's, and then of course, Condoleezza Rice is the first woman, the first African American a wo woman. She had made it in national security. And I remember watching her go toe to toe with the guys in a seminar that Sam Huntington ran in the 1980s on arms control, and she knew every weapon system, every <laughs> missile. I mean, she could just you know, dish it, and she did. So Hillary Clinton was strong enough, and she'd been on armed services and all of that, that she could actually elevate. This, to me, was the biggest thing I took away from working for her. I went in as a national security person. I came out as somebody who felt empowered to say development is just as important as diplomacy. And that w I do think there are more women in development. I think there are women on the ground often who are bringing that perspective in. So that is one place. I, there are plenty of men who also do that. But I think if you expand the number of women, you will hear more of a bottom-up 
focused on the realities of people's lives perspective in addition to the broader perspective. But that's a hypothesis. So I wanted to ask if, as you've added women to the roster, do you notice different perspectives? Um, yes, I think, that, I, think we, I think we do. Uh, you know, look, again, I, I'm speaking for one magazine, yes. and I'm just, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm an editor, so I'm, and I just move words around on a page and try and make people sound a little bit better. <laughs> Um, no, but we have noted, you know, look, we are not the mouthpiece of the, you know, the wood paneled walled Washington world. There are other magazines that do that. We don't care to do that. That is not what makes us a good and interesting place to read. Uh, you know, as Laura knows, you know, we've done a ton of stuff. We, ha we have dispatches from all over the world. I'd say, you know, we are pretty good in, and I don't know the stats, but I'd say we're pretty close to a fair representation in terms of who we're actually reaching out to to do stories. I mean, we've got Belle True writing from Egypt who does incredible stuff. We have people, you know, women all over the Middle East who are really impressive journalists who are working there uh, in Asia as well. And it's represented in our staff. Um, but yes, I mean, look, a, a, I think at its root, what I'm looking for is to make each article a great thing to read and to make the magazine as a whole a compelling glimpse of the world on any given day, every month, every year. Um, but there are stories, uh, you know, so I guess at some point I'm just looking for good writers. Um, and I think, the, you know, the Foreign Policy Interrupted Fellowship Program is actually a brilliant idea. I think the mentoring aspect is really important. Um, and sometimes it does take a little bit more work to find a young voice. Uh, and that's something we've done as well in terms of, you know, we've pushed away from the sort of old gray-haired white men who n say the same thing again and again <laughs> to try and be more diverse in our coverage. Um, and when you find a young person who's on the ground in Pakistan uh, or a young woman who can write with some authority about, you know, Abe's, women too. Abe's yeah. economic reforms um, in Japan, yeah. you do get a different perspective. You do get a, you know, they, and functionally, they have different sources. They have That's different people they quote. You find it in small, little, fine-grained ways. That's not a woman writing or planting a flag and saying, this is a story about gender and about women's role mm -hmm. in, the right. in foreign policy writ large. Because frankly, that's only so interesting, right? We do them when we find those stories are important in the same way we do stories about war writ large. We don't do a whole lot of those because I just don't need another think tanker telling me why we need to you know, more fully support the campaign against ISIS. There's only so much bandwidth I think our audience has for that. So we do find you know, that different voices bring different quality, uh, a different texture, and different opinions. So more women writing does not mean more writing about women, necessarily. I, I mean, you won't, you won't find that in our pages. I mean, when we recruit and, ta and use women writers, it's not because they are writing about women, it's because they're writing about the subjects we care about. Mm -hmm. It's because I need someone to write about the Nisman case in Argentina and what that means for Kirshner's government. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking to people for people who have expertise, not because I'm asking a woman mm -hmm. to write a story on gender. I mean, that's just as sexist as anything no, no. else. Exactly. Kim, exactly. Kim Barker, who um, she's a journalist at the New York Times, but she was with the Chicago Tribune, and she's got a fabulous book um, called The Taliban Shuffle. And she's written about this in her book, but she's also commented about how she had access when she was um, on the ground in Afghanistan, how she had access not only to the women, which was very difficult for, for the male correspondents to do, but she said she had unbelievable access to the, to the male politicians in Afghanistan. And in a way, she said that they would not talk to her male counterparts, that they actually, there was a different dynamic going on, and she actually got better scoops. Be by, by just by the very nature of who she was and what she brought to the table and the things that she would discuss with them. Yeah, the, the, that's true, and that's been true on, in terrorism. I'm looking at Peter Bergen, uh, who <laughs> in, in some ways disproves this because he's gotten extraordinary access uh, to various people in terrorist networks. But you know, the reason there's so many great women in terrorism is in the 1990s, it was not the cool and sexy thing to do. Lots of women who were getting pushed out of, gun, of standard guns and bombs went into terrorism, but they also found, if you talk to Jessica Stern or something, they got close to terrorist leaders and were able to interview them in ways it's very, very hard to imagine, to your point, that, that, mm -hmm. that a man could. Um, so, so let's talk more about the solutions, because I am also going to give all of you a chance to ask questions. Uh, but 
so we, we've got, you've got a, a list, you've got people writing. So I will just say as somebody who does subscribe to Foreign Policy Interrupted, I have found that when I want, I'm going to be on television on the weekend, I always read it and I do get, I just get different perspectives. I mean, it, and I, it's different women writing on different things, but it is not the normal run of show I, that, that I, I could get. So you've got this wonderful list and you can send it to bookers. You've got fellows. What else do we need? I mean, in, in your, your ideal world, foreign policy interrupted is wildly successful. What, what will that look like? Well, if we know we'll be successful if we don't exist in five years. Uh -huh. We don't want to exist. I mean, we'd love to extend this to... Don't tell your investors No, that. no, of course. No, 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 of course. But well, I mean, then they should be nonprofit and, and <laughs> investors interrupted, too. Uh, there you no, go. No, exactly. That's we, next. We see an interrupted needed, quite frankly, for, for every industry. Tech, even cooking. There are so many male chefs. I mean, honestly, Whoa, we need to... Poor I know. <laughs> we, need to, we, in, we need to interrupt a lot, but... Uh, we don't want to ex exist in five years. And it, you know, it's interesting because since soft launching this a year ago, we th started talking about this in earnest two years ago. We emailed you right off the bat. We're like, hi, Anne-Marie, we have an idea. <laughs> and uh, Anne-Marie is a perfect example of someone who has so much on her plate, but you've just been absolutely wonderful. wonderful. So thank you, endless gratitude. Um, but since soft launching with our visibility platform uh, about a year ago, we get emails all the time from women, and not just young sort of millennials, and we want to make it clear for our fellowship program, we're not looking you know, just to have 25 to 30 year olds, because we get emails all the time from academics across the country, at the University of Montana, you know, sure. one woman who's 50 years old, and is like, I just don't have the editorial context I need. How do I even go about pitching the New York Times? I have this idea, but I'm used to writing for academic journals. And again, back to the issue of editors not you know, having the bandwidth to cultivate these voices. So we need to do that and we need, you know, li listen, when, you, when you're talking about a field like foreign policy and there is low representation of women, I think sometimes we all, when I say we all women, we visualize the pie as being so small and we sort of have to fight our way. And, you know, there's a fair share of Sorara side and, and sometimes it's very competitive. <laughs> sometimes it's very competitive and women just don't feel that they have, you know, a close network that they can say, hey, do you have this contact at the New York Times that I can pitch? Because, you know, the person they're asking probably is pitching the New York Times right now, and she might visualize the pie is small. And, but we're all about, you know, success, not a zero-sum game. We're all about let's help each other. Yes, let's lean in, but let's not shove other women. And we're not this, we're not about, you know, cheerleading on women and, you know, kumbaya, let's braid each other's hair. But what we're doing is, <laughs> you can braid my hair if you want. But what we're, what we're, what we're doing is, is we're saying, you know what? If you have an expertise in something, own it, own it, you know? And celebrate yeah, other and celebrate women. Yeah, other women too. Celebrate other women. Help each other. So just to concrete things that people can do, number one, we're talking a lot about pitching the New York Times or the Post. Given the way media is now, just write. Right. If you have yes. something to say, yes. That's right. you know, start your own blog or go to Huffington Post and sign up for a blogging exactly. account or go to Vox. I mean, there's so many outlets now and places where you can write. And you would be amazed. You'd write it, tweet it, send it to your friends, tell them to do the same. There are a lot of people who you see on television now talking about different things. That's how they started. And bookers and editors are always kind of looking around for, okay, who's writing on this? And, you know, if your stuff comes up, they'll call you and see if you're somebody who could speak yeah. on it. The other thing which we, um, we've talked about is when you get that opportunity, and this is the soror side, um, if you can't do it, recommend another woman. That's recommend right. somebody else to do it. Um, and, and, you know, go and ask the same thing of the men that you know in the field who are on regularly mm -hmm. and say to them, hey, if you can't do it, you know, you were great on that show, stroke the ego a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you, but like, if you can't do it next time, you know, I'd really love it if you'd recommend me, right? And that takes a little bit of going back to where we kind of started in terms of having the confidence, okay, but when you get that phone call, you've got to go do it. Yeah. 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 Amen. I actually now tell people if I can't do it, I say check out Foreign Policy Interrupted. It's such a great list of lots of lots of, uh, of different people. I, I think that your point about building a portfolio is incredibly important. It is easier and easier to build a portfolio. And frankly, half of what we read is tweeted to us or emailed to us, and you don't even know where it comes from. The question is, is it good? Uh, and if, uh, Often, you know, you can publish in the New York Times, but if you don't send it out, it's not necessarily, I mean, it'll be read by lots of people, but not, not everybody by, by a long shot. 
So before we, I'm going to turn it over, but any more thoughts on what else we can do? Just, nope. All right. Yes. Just do it. Let's do it. <laughs> if you'll do, wait for the microphone and introduce Hi. yourself, please. I'm, uh, the wood panel room has been mentioned a couple of times. I'm the closest representative of that here. I'm Stephen <laughs> Cook from the Council on no, Foreign Steve Relations. It's wonderful. great. Yeah. It's great to see you all. <laughs> Some of my favorite people on this panel. First, uh, to Elmira and Lauren, this is wonderful. I'm hoping that uh, in five years, you do, we won't need foreign policy interrupted. You're both consumers of pictures of my six-year-old and nine-year-old daughters, and that's why this is, in particular, very, very important to me. But we're, you want to talk about solutions, and something odd has ha happened to me in my career, and I think it speaks to, we've talked a lot about media and bookers and so on and so forth. I started at the Council on Foreign Relations a decade ago. I had done zero. I had written a dissertation, and by the luck of God, was offered a position at the Council. On day one, I get a phone call from someone, it's some, whether it's CNN or MSNBC or ABC or NBC, can I come on and talk about something? I had done absolutely nothing. And I, my, my sense was, I went home and I said to my wife, I said, anybody could have been sitting in that seat. And so another part of this is this institutional thing. So people like you, Anne Marie, who are on boards of these organizations need to exercise this influence in getting people who are not white and male into these seats because that really, that's something, once I was on TV, once I could, I proved I could talk on TV and write something, people just came back to me. And I'm confident that all of the people in this room can absolutely yeah. do that. Yes, you right. can, but you had, you had CFR. And that's exactly. what they were calling right. for. Right. right. And that's what I'm saying okay. is that more people, right, I just want to add, like, hold yeah. on one second. People in positions like Anne Marie and others need to, who are in these places, can exercise influence. The other thing, the other problem that strikes me is Anne Marie's that you just, doing, you got to get Richard Haas to do it. Well, look, oh. you know, we've got, we, we have oh. increased the number of senior fellows who are women at the Council on Foreign Relations. Our defense policy expert is, is actually women, but I'm not here to talk about, I'm thinking about the future and future solutions. Exactly. And it, it's something that else that I think, I think Karen mentioned it, and, 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 and Lauren mentioned it about Sorara side. It, there's also males who want to hog this stuff. People have called me to talk about Guinea-Bissau. Yeah. <laughs> what do I know about Guinea-Bissau? I won't go on, but there are people who will. Yeah. They'll quickly do a Google search and go on. So what I try to do, and I invite all the 11 other males who are here, when you get that call, <laughs> first of all, don't take it if you're not an expert on it. And if you know of a woman who's an expert yeah. on it, right. tell the booker to do that. I, I feel like a lot of the bookers are just Google searching, and the Council on Foreign Relations, or Pretty Brookings, much. or the Washington Institute yep. comes up. Exactly. Sure. And a lot of times that's what comes yeah. out. I mean, that's the reality. And, Thank and, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, then they're here on the side. Does somebody want to? I just want to say, I just want to bring us back to, because I think those are all great points, but we, it, we're we also talking about, I think there's two parts to that. Yes, there's the part that you were speaking to, but then also, and I think this is the piece where it's helpful to have a woman's perspective. As women, we have to have more confidence so that when you get the call. I was going to say, a lot of women exactly. would have said, I can't do this on first right. day on the job. And I just want right. to add, I mean, as a journalist in the, as a journalist, yeah. well, as a journalist in the Middle East for the past four years, I know wherever I'm on the ground, if I'm in Egypt, if I'm in Syria with Katie and Dara, when the <laughs> uprising is breaking out, I call and email Steve. Steve is ready at all hours to give me great quote, just brain food. He's there. He's on it. I will call a woman not just because she's a woman, but because she knows her stuff and I want her in my piece. And the majority of the time, I would and I still get, I'm just not really read in on it. Give me a couple days. My girl, my deadline is like in two <laughs> hours. I need it now. So that's, I mean, that's, yes, where the confidence comes in. But we also need to, yes, we need to get over it. We need to be confident. But we do need a little push. So that's what we're doing here. So there are a couple, uh, we're going to take a couple at a time. Uh, so there are a couple, so th this woman here in black, uh, move forward. Whoa, I'm, oh, okay, that, that woman in black too. But this woman <laughs> in black. <laughs> I don't uh, know okay, thank you so much. My name is, is this on? okay, my name is Courtney Raj. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists. And I have two questions. When you started to talk about the economic aspect, I thought you were going to talk about the economic aspect of balancing a full-time job and trying to produce content. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a real issue because, you know, as someone who's gotten a PhD and has a blog, so I'm trying to kind of like hit both sides of that, right? 
I mean, you only have so many hours in the day to write content and it's great to like do it on your blog or Huffington Post, but it gets buried. So how do you address that? How do we shift the economics so that's also addressed? And okay, then so I think- hold that question. One of you is gonna answer that question. Okay, <laughs> yeah. quick second question. Well, uh, uh, let me give it to somebody else. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, so hold that because we're gonna get, catch three here. Yes, in blue and then we'll go back to Nicole and then we'll. I'll take another second. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Najia Khan. I'm with, with Alt Muslim Magazine, where I'm an associate editor there. First of all, I want to say thank you. I feel so empowered this afternoon by hearing all this, because so many words you guys said um, are in my mind the last decade. I'm the mom of four, been at home, but have a degree in South Asian studies. By the way, I'm a Pakistani who can be kind of eloquent. So <laughs> if you need me, I'm here. <laughs> but I wouldn't have the confidence to say just that until I heard the words. Um, the last 30 minutes. But uh, my comment was just to say thank you. I'm empowered by being here, by being at home and working and writing, editing, the deadlines are so difficult to achieve. And I feel that if I can put something else aside, I can achieve that. But doing it all is challenging. And I appreciate that being acknowledged and recognized. And I feel comfortable enough in this room to say all that. And I thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. One more, and then we'll. Thanks, Anne-Marie, great to see you. Uh, my name's Nicole Golden. I'm currently adjunct faculty at George Washington University, and I'm affiliated with CSIS. Um, in the global movement around gender equality, one of the biggest parts of that movement right now is he for she, and um, engaging men in the fight for gender equality. And so to your point that there's 11 men in the room, I'm curious how is you're building this movement, um, your readership, um, your subscribers, how you're sort of expanding that to include men as obviously an important part of the, of the process. And also, um, Karen, you were asking the question about how many women would watch a show about all women. I think an interesting question is how many men would watch a foreign and policy can I just tell you, show with just all, really quickly, with all a women? A lot, because most of my viewers were men over 50. I'm <laughs> telling you, a little lip gloss, a little, you know, something, something. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding because what has Fox figured out? It's not, it doesn't hurt if what you're watching looks kind of nice. I'm not kidding. I mean, right? Like how much attention did Condoleezza Rice get when she walked in with those troops with those hot boots on? I mean, right? It's well, like. Yeah, good balance. Yeah, but totally, but, you I know, hear you. To I that hear point, they'll be ourselves, I, I guess, you. also. I hear you. Um, okay, so for you, there was the, the economic question and yeah. then uh, the question of what, what are you doing for he for she? I mean, I think just on the economics of it and sort of balancing time, I mean, the deadlines are what they are, right? And so, and I know for me, part of the challenge is, because I write weekly for Media Matters, you know, I was writing a piece about uh, the, what's really going on in the French, um, the slums or the banui, and I wrote 13 pages for a 700 word thing because I was so like over preparing. So part of it is I think we have to check ourselves a little bit on that. That's not to say you don't want to be you know, proficient and accurate and all of that, but I do think women tend to over-prepare and over-research. I do it every week, mm -hmm. and I literally every week have a conversation with myself where I'm like, okay, you have to stop. You have to just, get over it. Uh, yeah, yeah, get over it. Respect right? your editor's word count. Yes. <laughs> well, and I would also say, uh, also respect the fact your editor can help you. Because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us, I send in a monthly column for Project Syndicate. They're very good editors, right? And, and each, at, he's not going to write it for me, but I can send in something that's you know a thousand words. That's is going to get cut down. No, 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 <laughs> uh, no, no. A good editor. <laughs> in other words, a lot of guys yeah, send yeah. in things that then get the help. I, I, I do yeah. think there's that sense that it's got to be really, really good. And honestly, there's a point where the best is the enemy of the good, and the editors exactly. exist in part to help you make your work better, and they can they can help. These guys can speak to the balance. I mean, I think just to your question, I mean, on the economics of it, um, it is hard to balance it all, frankly. I mean, that's just that's a reality, and I think a lot of women end up feeling like something's going to have to drop in order for me to do, you know, these five other things because I can't do 20 things at once. And I I just think that's until we have it better ways of supporting women and men, frankly, in the workplace, I, that's just going to be a reality. So yeah, I, I want to speak a little bit to the confidence issue. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people who've, who, uh, you know, have been young and starting out as writers face that problem, you know, and it's not a gender thing, and, and yet there is a gender component. But, you know, also to the zero-sum game, there's often that feeling, and I think a lot of writers feel it, that if somebody else has written on the same subject, well, they probably know it a little bit better. Oh, they stole my idea. I mean, you know, as 
any editor will tell you, especially in this online environment, there's a constant need to feed the engine. And you know, I can't tell you how many pieces I've run on any number of subjects. You name it, you know, it's 15 pieces in the last two months. Mm -hmm. uh, and things change, and you want a different voice, you want a different perspective, you want to work and sort of work with a different author and build something with a, a different person. So I just encourage people to you know, not be afraid to send that pitch. I think getting over that hurdle, certainly for me, has been a big deal. Uh, when I was a freelancer and a writer, I think a lot of people feel that. Um, but just because somebody who you know, may have more expertise or you see their name in Project Syndicate has written that same subject before, it doesn't mean that your, your voice, your opinion, or your particular take on it isn't valid. And just sending a pitch, even if it's killed, even if someone says, look, this is really, we're not going to work with this right now, you have to stay at it. You have to do it. I mean, any freelancer knows this. It's a grind. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, work getting, it's work getting your name out there and work getting your words on, on the paper. And all of us get rejected by the New all York Times so on a regular basis. <laughs> always. <laughs> and, you, and you have to deal with, you have to deal with that. And so the he for she point. The, the he for she, um, I, you know, we, we, I mean, this is definitely one of the things that when Lauren and I sat down, we, we said, we don't want to be just the girls club. And so we actually proactively reached out to all of our male colleagues and our male counterparts who, you know, not only to discuss it with them, but I know that I've had several discussions. I mean, Steve Cook is here and he's a dear friend of mine. Um, we both follow Turkey, but he, you know, he's, part of the problem is also we assume that they understand the challenges we have. They don't. And so I would sit down, I mean, this may probably 10 years ago, you know, and I would say to Steve, you know, I'm so frustrated. And he was very proactive in listening to me and helping me out. And so if I'm able to sit here today, he is in large part of it. You know, Max Fisher's back there. You know, I've, I've pitched Max Fisher. And, you know, Love he took Max. the time to sit and to listen. And so it's not just about trying to get onto the pages of the New York Times. It is about blogging. But it's also about going to the male counterparts and saying, you know what, I have an idea and I'd like to sit down with you. I'd like to have a cup of coffee and I'd like to share with you with my ideas because you know what? They are open to it and they are receptive of it. Of it. And when you're doing that, you are building your audience and you are building your expertise because then they can go and they can speak to the bookers and the producers and the networks that they know and they can say, you know what? Whether it's me or whether it's Lauren, that person knows what she's talking about, and they can be your advocate. Absolutely. So let's take yeah. another another set here in the front. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Sekero. I'm the president of an organization called Hope for Tomorrow. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and I'm from Kenya. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, thank you for meeting you again. Uh, what they, this was a wonderful conversation, and I happened to invite several African women. You know, uh, women empowerment and women policy was first studied in Africa, in Kenya, 1985, when the women... Uh, uh, policy started and uh, empowerment before China and before UN in New York. So the Africans where the policy started and the empowerment started are the ones who are back again, who don't understand what is going on, what is happening, apart from now women getting into politics, uh, into parliament, like we have Rwanda, 51% of women in uh, politics. As she said and she, she mentioned, our organization has set up uh, an ICT program in the rural areas. I'm focusing on the rural care area of Kenya, Western Kenya, where we are now going to be using cell phones to the rural area women to talk because everybody cannot write, but with the young people listening to them and writing what, it, what they are talking about, this is also media. So we should not underestimate the rural women who have more powerful policy than just looking at the actual media who are out there to report the story. You go to get the story from them and you report, you get the credit out of their story and they remain there suffering, they don't know what is happening. So how do we get actually work together with African countries, like where I'm going to do my projects in ICT, in Nigeria, and other countries like the Lost Girls of Nigeria, the girl who has just pumped the people, 2,000 people in Nigeria and died. And mostly women are victims when there are violence and conflicts, and nobody reports about that. How do we work with you on media, on, uh, on social media, and just writing? So how do we connect right. that and work together to make this happen? Great, thank you. There on the on the. Hello, my name is Joyce Rogers Halliday, and I'm the executive director of the International Association of African NGOs. 
I'm also a member of the think tank on social accountability with the World Bank. Just to piggyback on what um, Rosemary just mentioned, I'm from Nigeria, and the typical African woman is stripped of her self-esteem from birth. Mm. You know, you're, you're taught to follow your brothers behind, you're taught to you know, worship your husbands, you're taught to speak only when you're asked to speak. So a lot of that internal stuff, you know, uh, is basically convicts them. They're, they're crippled by the internal uh, um, stuff that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, not only that, I want to just encourage, I'm so ex empowered by what you're doing here, because we need that on the, on the continent. Most of the, over 90% of the decisions that were made and have resulted in war on the continent were made by men. They were not women on the table. They were just men. And I am so excited now that in this century, a lot of women are now speaking out. And we need to encourage them to speak. I don't care if you're speaking Latin, you're speaking <laughs> Russian, if you're speaking. You need to just get up and speak. Good. Because particularly when it concerns uh, war and peace, the women, at the end of the day, bear the brunt of the war, the women and children. So I just want to encourage every woman, you have something to say, just speak. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next. Right next. Oh, I thought to you, yeah, right there. Hi, uh, I'm Jenna Ben Yehuda. It's nice to see you. Um, I founded the Women's Foreign Policy Network over the summer, I spent 12 years, not to outpanel your mahogany paneling, but at the State Department, <laughs> where there's, there's a lot of that. The State Department and the Council are I win. We're close. Okay. Um, and I was struck, as I just invited 15 of the most amazing women I knew from State to dinner at this hunger that existed for women just to connect. Just to connect. Have you seen this? When I was in a negotiation, you won't believe what they pulled with me. Do you know? Oh, I know somebody. Let me introduce you. So I think the other piece of this, besides the print and the media element, which is so critical, is that there are lots of women who write, who you don't, you don't get to read their stuff because it's classified cables or reporting cables, but they're part of the decision-making process, We'd too. We'd love to read that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, now a lot of it you can, besides the point. But there is something to be said for the ability just to connect women because these women leave government or come and go and leave in various administrations, and they're the next writers, right? Or they're the next political appointees, and you want to create that pipeline too, but there needs to be some element of community and somebody to lift you up. Right. Um, and there's right. a lot of hunger for that. Right. So, so one more before we go back to the panel. There on the, and then I'll turn to the back. Yeah, I see people far in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Samhar Araya, and it's a pleasure to meet Lauren in person yeah, it's a on pleasure Twitter. To meet you. I follow We're her. We're Twitter friends. And of course, <laughs> Anne Marie Slaughter and the rest of the panel, very um, esteemed, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a background in conflict and development and now teach at GW, but I also run a Diaspora African Women's Network. And a lot of the things you're saying about gender and access ring true at that racial and ethnic level. Um, but also what's been interesting is when it comes to discussions on very geopolitical hotspots, security areas, Horn of Africa is my area, Sudan and Horn of Africa, uh, because it's such a male-driven and, and, and DC-centric established conversation, you know, the last, the, the, the different spaces I've been in, it's, it's, it's everything you've highlighted. What I have found that has been really instrumental is social media. Mm -hmm. And you've talked extensively about television. Um, but in, in my case and in the diaspora's cases and in, uh, and in these regions like the Horn of Africa where access to information is so difficult to gain, to, to, to penetrate, um, Twitter has decentralized the conversation and I now you know, regularly work with journalists off the record, sometimes on the record, but in particular on issues of foreign policy that are more soft power, which I think rounding out this conversation. So I wanted to get your thoughts on the power of, of social media, how it's um, served even for, for FP, I'm um, subscribed to that. And also a pleasure to meet some friends I see in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it's good. good. Thank you. Well, so we have three minutes. I've been um, oh. remiss, actually, because we are supposed to end at 1.45, although some of you can and stay on. So I'm going to go down and let, there were three questions there, particularly on focusing on a broader set of women, particularly African women, but women, rural women and everywhere, women who are not heard from. And I would particularly be interested in connecting that to the point that Yes, we know when women are on peace delegations, different things happen. We've got lots of research on that. And yet, we talk about broadening foreign policy. 
so that it's more than war. How about getting women into the core, which is war? Uh, exactly. So I'd like to hear your responses and thoughts uh, in a final round. And I'll go down this way. Well, actually, let me reverse it. Let You'll me start. Go that way. Okay, we'll go this better. way. <laughs> All right. <I'll> <laughs> okay, I want to go last. No, no, no. All right, Elmira. Elmira. Yeah, you go first. Okay. Come on, it's only fair. Really? I'm dogging up no, on no, me now? Um, <laughs> look, you know, it is, it, I, I think, you know, finding, uh, there are a lot of underserved communities, you know, African women, uh, and, you know, you can name, there's, there's lots of them. Um, it is a difficult thing as an editor to find a way to give voice to those people. Uh, you know, I, speaking practically, it's hard to find people who can write. But what we're looking for are journalists, men and women, who can tell these stories uh, in a compelling way. I mean, really, m my job at the end of the day is to put good words on a page and to, to make readers and the people out here feel like foreign policy is a place to come and get those stories. And they are security stories. They are development stories. They are war stories, too. Um, and you know what we've seen in places like Baga in uh, in Nigeria, uh, you know it's very difficult to tell those stories. It's very difficult to get access. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to get those voices. But when you do, it's extraordinarily compelling. And so it's not just numbers on the page, or you know satellite images from above, mm -hmm. or an analyst in Washington trying to tell those stories. And that's I think what makes for good magazine journalism. And quickly on the social media side, I mean. This is enormously important, and I just want to <laughs> highlight my colleague over there, Emma. Raise your hand, Emma. Oh, Emma, stand <laughs> up, because you're fabulous. Emma's amazing. <laughs> my colleague, who is, who is <laughs> really responsible, and she's very shy, but she is, uh, <laughs> she is an enormous. A fabulous Twitter feed. Uh, and enormously she's important great, in, yeah. in um, building the social media presence of our magazine. And she speaks a lot on uh, social media uh, and gender component as well. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage great. all of you to follow her and reach out. Yeah, and just really quick point, I'm so sorry. What is your name? Joyce Nigapak. Joyce, yes. So I was in Nigeria last spring. I, I planned my reporting trip before Bring Back Our Girls. And when I was on the ground, I got a lot of emails from editors and you know producers at networks. Hi, can we have you on to talk about this? And it wasn't just not knowing my stuff, but it was my first trip to Nigeria. And I'm like, you know what? Why do I, just because I have a relatively high, you know, social media visibility, whatever that means. Why am I being called upon? I have five Nigerian colleagues around me, also women. Give them the mic. Give them the mic. So, Meyer, which of you want? I, I mean, I think just, just on a broader level, I think this is not just about interrupting foreign policy. I think, as, as Lauren pointed out, I think a lot of industries need, a, in, need interrupting. So I think it's a systemic issue, and I think a lot of uh, there was a couple of questions about balance, and I know that this I'm is I'm going to say something about you know, that this right is, at the this end. Is, <laughs> you know, this is a subject I know that's near and dear to you. You know, it, it's not the responsibility of a woman to take care of a family. I mean, it's it's a responsibility that everyone has, and I think now it's the 21st, it's 2015, people. It's time that we stop putting that that burden on our shoulder, and you know, stop being so hard on ourselves. Um, you know. I started practicing yoga about 10 years ago, and the greatest lesson that I, that I took away from yoga is it's, it's about progress, not perfection. And so, you know, really take one step at a time and just know that your good is good enough. But just get out there because it's not just, an, and this is something that my mother actually said to me when I, I, I said, people are encouraging me to write a book. And, she, and I said, but I can't write a book. You know what, you know, you who, who am I? And my mother said, write a book, write it for me because it's, you know, you explain things in a way that I understand it. So she said, don't write it for yourself, write it for me. So when you're doing it, ladies, do it for other women and do it for the cause. That's great. That's <laughs> um, I w so a couple things. One, I think social media is incredibly important. And I think the story of the lost girls is perfect in terms of social media helped make that a story, right? It was going on for a long time and people weren't really paying attention. So I think social media is incredibly powerful. Um, and I would say, I don't mean to be a downer after such an inspiring thing. Unfortunately, I think stories out of Africa just get less attention, that's period. A, that's also awesome I mean, a challenge as well. You know, the best ex recent example, you know, what happened, and I called my mother, flipping out. A 10 year old girl, bomb strapped her, go, has to go into a village. She doesn't even know what's happening. And yes, what happened in Paris was horrendous, but one got so much more attention mm -hmm. than the other. Part of the challenge was they couldn't get the information out, and part of when we started to find out the story was survivors had actually made it to places where they could, and reporters finally made it to places where they could communicate. But 
th so this I would say would be the, the next wave. It's women, but also in terms of communities of color, people of color, and change in the way we think about um, continents like Africa, like the Middle East, and the stories coming from there, because most of what we see is death, destruction, and war, mm -hmm. and we don't get to see the other side from those other voices and faces. Right. Thank you. So thanks to all of you. I will say one last word in parting that uh, you mentioned that foreign policy interrupted is not just about younger women, and it shouldn't be. The greatest untapped pool of talent out there are women in their late 40s, early 50s, 60s, who took time out mm -hmm. because they are raising families. And yes, it is all of our responsibility, but let's face it, those women are, still have the credentials, still have the interest. They may need a little help getting back in, but that's a, those are women whose voices we should hear all over the world just as much as the millennial women. You can't do it all at the same time, but you can do it. You just need people who are willing to let you try. So with that, uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to Peter uh, and the International Security Program.